o na moana for koka aho i mahiana he ka tohu tohu aho hi everybody thank you all for being here today for our final webinar of the year uh, my name is sophie sparrow i'm a communications advisor at the sustainable seas national science challenge uh, and i'll be facilitating this webinar today so today we'll be hearing about how in order to uphold long-term power fishery values the value of commercial power quota and the ecological role that power play in the marine environment power fisheries must be supported to be more resilient to environmental change power fisheries are increasingly at risk from environmental change Currently, neither fisheries management, fishing sectors, or seafood business investors and lenders systematically account for any value change related to environmental change, either as risks or opportunities. Now, undertaken with Tierra Moana, ANZ, and participants from the power industry, the Upholding the Value of Power Quota project has been exploring what, fishery, uh, what power fishery investors need to know to have the confidence to invest uh, and the relationship between risk, quota valuation and management responses. So this project considered risks to power populations and growth and to the coastal infrastructure essential for accessing the fisheries and underlying power catch, leading to the development of a financial scenario model. Informed by the structure of the fishery stock assessment model, this new model enables various climate change risk scenarios to be run to indicate potential financial value change into the future. Now today you'll be hearing from some of the team behind this research. We have Tony Craig, who is co-leader of the Upholding the Value of Power Quota project and is a partner at Terra Moana Limited. Dean Spicer is also a member of the project's research team and is head of sustainable finance for ANZ Bank. Uh, and Storm Stanley is Chair of the Power Industry Council, a national organisation representing the interests of participants in New Zealand's commercial power fisheries. Now before we begin, just some quick housekeeping. So this webinar is being recorded uh, and we'll have that recording up on our YouTube channel within the next 24 hours if you would like to share that with others. Uh, we'll email out a link to the recording when it is ready. Now, our presenters are going to speak for around the first half an hour, and then we'll have time for some questions and answers. So please ask your questions using the Q&A function, which will be down the bottom of your screen. Uh, I'll be reading out the questions to our presenters so everyone can hear them. Uh, and please do feel free to send those questions through via the Q&A at any time during the presentation, uh, and we'll get to them when we're ready for questions. All right, that is all from me. Over to you, Tony. Kia ora, Sophie. Um, I hope the screen's visible. Uh, um, yep. Okay, great. Well, uh, welcome everyone um, to, to this uh, webinar. I'm pleased to be able to present it. Um, my name, of course, Tony Craig. I've been in the seafood uh, industry now for close on 35 of my 67 years. And uh, I'm part of this team uh, with Storm Stanley and Dean Spicer that will be presenting today. Um, we want to point out right from the start that uh, we're neither scientists or researchers, but we are um, observers of change and practitioners in our field, and we do ask a lot of questions. The photo you see in front of you is, uh, that is my uh, batch or crib, if you're from the South Island, uh, at the top in the distance, uh, that's the road just before it, and that's the effect that I've been witnessing over my years at might be interesting to, to know that I've been going out there since I was born, basically. And at, at one stage, there was at least 20 metres to the right of that road uh, of land that was sitting there. So we know things are changing. Um, I'm going to leave the screen up. There's a lot of people to acknowledge here uh, so that you can see it. But while I'm doing and you're looking through those names, it would be remiss of me not to mention uh, five wonderful women that have been part of this project. Uh, Dr. Julie Hall for having the vision uh, and listening to us to think about this as a project uh, from NIWA. Uh, Christine Smith, uh, who's developed the model, uh, courtesy of the ANZ Bank. She's been invaluable uh, and 
Dr. Judy Hewitt and Rhonda Cummins for their science and research support. And then finally, uh, my business partner, Catherine Short. Um, she has been uh, instrumental in all uh, to making sure that it, it's finally got to where it is today. Um, a little bit of background about, um, sorry, I should have said that uh, out of those 35 years for the last 13, I've been in partners in Terramoana Limited with uh, Catherine. And during that time, um, uh, I was the chair of the Power 2 uh, Industry Association from 2005 to 2021. So I had quite an um, input into um, understanding uh, power fisheries management. Uh, in 2017, uh, we delivered the first ever um, worldwide ecosystem service review of a commercially fish species in a partnership project with Moana New Zealand, uh, then known as Aotearoa Fisheries, the Sustainable Business Council, and the Department of Conservation. Um, I must give credit to Catherine, she did a large piece, large piece of the work. And ironically, that work was focused in the top of the South Island, uh, in what, what we know as Fisheries Management Area 7, which we'll be touching on a little bit later in this presentation. We were also uh, instrumental in helping shape the MB bid for the Moana project, which has looked at um, uh, water temperatures, hindcast modeling, uh, currents, current directional flows, uh, and now has a, a massive sensors out on commercial fishing vessels, vessels giving us almost a million data points a month uh, to helping us understand what's going on, not just on the, at the top of the water, but all the way through the water column. And then finally, uh, we're just doggedly pursued the science challenge for this program, given uh, our work in ecosystem-based management. Why power and power two? Uh, well, um, they are a highly valued, valued commercial species. Um, They're highly prized by both customer and recreational interest. They're sedentary, so they don't move far. We've, the saying we've used is basically they're the canary in the coal mine. They're going to see the effects of climate change probably quicker than anyone from uh, land-based uh, impacts, um, which they are susceptible to. Um, Power 2 has been probably one of the most solid performing fisheries um, over, the, over the years, and I'll show you a little bit about that. Covers a significant log, longitudinal geographical area. What you can see is that, that, that um, in the coloured on the red, that while it, the Power 2 goes from East Cape all the way up through Taranaki, the commercial fishery is only open from basically Blackhead, Central Hawke's Bay to Tarakurai Point, um, uh, just off Wellington. Um, but we also know that there are very differing size ranges and the further north you go, the smaller a lot of the fish get um, in their growth rates. We talked about, we asked a lot of questions. I asked a simple question of uh, Dr. Norman Ragg, um, who's a leading shellfish biologist. Some time ago, I said, for there to be powers on a rock, Norman, to harvest, what are the key things we should be focusing on? on? He responded uh, relatively 65% water quality, 20% habitat, 15% food. And I knew at the time we didn't focus a lot on that as fisheries managers. And so the it, to me, it drove a whole bunch of additional questions, which is how much do we know and understand about these factors? What impact them? them how are we measuring them? And how do we respond to the potential impacts? Part of the work uh, in the Moana project, towards the end of it, this work came out, um, which began to uh, help in um, me understanding that the hunch that we had right from the first place was possibly right. What you're seeing here is the work of Dr. Chris Roach, which is looking at uh, the 21.5 degree temperature line changes over time under climate change scenario. Now that 21.5 degree is really, really important because power grow relatively quickly uh, from zero to 80 mils but then slow and they slow even greater at, at, as the temperatures get warmer. And certainly at, at these levels at one uh, at 21.5 degrees, and his conclusion that it's unlikely that fish would, while power stocks will still be there, it's unlikely that they'll be going through to the minimum legal size of one, two, five 
millimeters, which then says to me, how do you, what happens then if you take, like we've been doing in power two, taking a paddock approach to managing by stock, stock area, area how, how, how would you manage from a policy point of view of a differing temperature and size range in your northern paddocks to the, the paddocks in the south? So what did we set out to do? Um, <clears throat> we set out to, um, could we look at climate change from a commercial impact perspective? Could we better understand the stresses, stressors? Uh, what, did, what do we know that we don't know about them and their effect on the fishery and the ecological infrastructure that supports them? Was it even possible to market the stresses financially? So when you look at things, so when I was, I was appointed the business pilot innovation and quota manager for Aotearoa Fisheries, Manau Moana, New Zealand in 2004, one of the roles I had to undertake was to develop a weighted average cost of capital model to understand what one should be prepared to pay for quota uh, if you went to the market. And what, a, what this model in simple terms does is all, invest, all investments are commensurate with risk. The trick is working out what that level of risk might be. And one way is simply applying this weighted average cost of capital. And it simply starts with uh, what is known as a free rate of return, which is the government bond rate, which is the most risk-free investment that you can make. Governments generally don't fall over. And then you add additional factors for risks, i.e. Uh, interest rates, management influence, uh, security of access, nature of tenure, all of those things, you're, you're adding um, levels of risk or percentage of return on investment that you'd need to, to, to make that investment commensurate with any other business investment over time. Interestingly, even in 2004, we weren't thinking a lot about climate risk uh, in our risk profiles. And my, how things have changed, obviously. And you're going to hear from Dean Spicer uh, a little later in this presentation how the financing world's focus is changing in respect of looking at climate change and climate intervention. So I took you. So this slide illustrates the differences in two power fisheries: Power Two, um, as I showed you in the map earlier, and Power Seven at the top of the North Island. The top two graphs show you. The black line is the total allowable commercial catch lines, TACC. The green line is the catch that's been taken during that period, and that's from 2001 to 2020. And the blue line is what we've assessed as the average value of quota based on ACE prices, annual catch entitlement prices. So you can see that on the, on the right-hand side that Power 7 has had considerable cuts to its TACC over time. And you can see that the catch has, has uh, to a large extent, dropped under that uh, for many of the years. Whereas Power 2, the catch has always met the TACC over, the, over those years. You see little jumps in those values in Power 7. Um, you could argue that they could be uh, a lot to do with how people feel, feel that there's more security in the investment with the quote has been cut. There's more chance that it's likely to be caught and sustained at that level. But that's what those two graphs are telling you. The bottom two graphs are multiplying that price per, per ton on, on the graphs above by the total TACC of the fishery. And so you can see that um, the power two fishery has largely stayed um, constant with a value of around 50 million ton, whereas the power seven fishery has dropped from a high of 90 million, ton, uh, $90 million in value down to below 30. Just a, there's an updated price check just to give you an instant. And Storm will talk about the importance of consistency of fisheries performance. Is that the price for, per, per ton estimated at the moment for Power 2 is up as high as 600,000. And in Power 7, they've unfortunately had to shelve a further 50% of that last green bar of 80 ton. And that quota price sits at around $250,000 a ton. So it's important that the health consistency of that fishery, it drives through into quota values. Um, 
So our project aims, we really try to develop a shared understanding of environmental driven risks, uncertainties and opportunities facing the wild power. To develop a model to assess business risks and uncertainties facing the sector. Hopefully use the model to guide investment and resilience planning. Develop the model for use across other fisheries and hopefully better inform advanced management and policy debate on, on options going forward. The what if this happens, what would we do in response, not just from a research understanding, but from a policy and a fisheries management point, point of view. Major findings of the review. Well, it is possible to build structurally sound model to consider, to consider the climate change trajectories. The model can be adapted to other fisheries but obviously the biological uh, and dependency parameters would change for that. Uh, the work exposed uh, difficulties in understanding and including sub-emergent stock levels to the model. That's those um, power that are uh, below 80, 70 to 80 millimetres before they come out under the rocks to, um, from protection. And there was a lack of research on the biological impacts of exposure to short-term sediment events, prolonged suspended sediment events, heat waves, and gradual warming. So with that, I'll hand over to Storm. Ah, kia ora, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Storm Stanley. I'm the... Uh... Chair of the Power Industry Council and had most of my working life as a power diver. Now I'm <clears throat> a cotton top like many of us in offices and um, I do the office work for the Power Industry Council. For this project, um, Dr. Tom McGowan, who's the Power Industry Council Science Officer, and I provided um, information on the parts of the report that were concerned with um, power biology, um, fisheries characterization, uh, population dynamics, and uh, climate change effects on the biology of power and the implications of that. So the stuff we did was um, the, the 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 context and background bits. We didn't really have anything to do with the development of the model or Dean's work, of course. So um, that that was our contribution to it. So, um, TC, could you kick off that video, please? So I've included a, a friend sent this video, through, this underwater piece of footage to me. So. That is the reference in there that says, do healthy populations of power like power like this have value? And what does that mean? Um, I'm sure you recognize a, uh, a rhetorical question when you see it. Um, the answer is, but of course. Um, while, while the project was intended to focus on value in the commercial sense, I figured that um, a predictive tool like the one proposed, if it worked, would have wider interest. Um, for instance, iwi might well be able to use such modeling to verify choices of customary fisheries tools that um, they might look at deploying in response to or in anticipation of um, environmental change effects so while upholding the value of um, quota was important the wider possible applications did catch my interests um, value well natural things everyone knows it um, they have an intrinsic value just by existing a healthy power fishery has value just by being there. It's part of a functioning marine ecosystem. It eats stuff. Some stuff eats it. Recreational fishers value the ability to gather a feed. And they love, and love the, uh, um, the family-based fishing experience and diving. And I've been told many times that the mana of Tangata Whenua in New Zealand is undermined if they cannot provide kaimoana, that's seafood, like power, to manuhiri, that's guests. Um, and of course, our guys have to have um, healthy fisheries to be able to make a living and feed their families. So value is a pretty wide description. One of the drivers of value that I see is confidence. And by confidence, I mean <clears throat> that the fishery will remain healthy and it will remain productive into the future. TC showed you a graph earlier of what happens to power quota trading values when a fishery um, declines. It's common, it, it's common sense. If you don't have confidence in the future of um, an investment, then the value of that, the monetary value of that investment will drop. But everyone else, the community, has to have confidence that their fisheries are still going to be around for the next generation or three or four, and confidence that any threats are anticipated and, and hopefully in, uh, um, addressed. 
I need to um, try and understand as part of my work what to have a crystal ball. What's coming? What can we, what can we possibly do about it? We need to be forward looking in our game. Um, Pick already has access to some pretty sophisticated population stock modelling developed by Dragonfly Science based in Wellington. It's informed by a lot of near real time, very fine scale fishing data. And we have for a long time invested heavily in research and understanding the biology and population characteristics of power fisheries. But this is very resource intensive. Um, and this project, if it worked, could offer a simpler and more generally accessible tool which could complement that sort of stuff. And this was this was also something of interest. Yeah, on the next slide, mate. Should okay, so some. here we are. Oh, you've jumped a slide, I think. Oh, no, there we go. Okay, so sorry about that glitch. Um, the project, you can see it there, the project confirms really what we already knew and and one of the things we knew is that um no one really knows what how climate change is going to pay it play out really in the um inshore marine area we've got some ideas and you can predict but the it's complex it's interrelated and that it may be mutually reinforcing when things happen. Um, and I've got this example here. Look, you look at that picture. That picture was taken at midnight on the 28th of July in 2022 at Karka Point in the Catlins in the South Island. At several thousand power were washed ashore at high tide, dead and dying. The cause was an intense um, east-northeast weather event bringing very high rainfalls into the massive um, Clutha River uh, catchment. And that caused, of course, a huge flooding event. Um, the fresh water that flowed out into Molyneux Bay at the uh, mouth of the Clutha River sat as a deep layer on top of the uh, seawater. You know, fresh water sits on top of seawater. Um, the onshore wind, the northeasterly wind that was there, held that fresh water layer inshore for quite a long time. And then when the tide went out, the power in shallow water got a fresh water bath, which of course killed them. Um, power don't live in fresh water like most sea creatures. Um, so was this climate change related? Well, maybe. It's happened before at Karka Point, but this is likely to be the most severe example um, anyone's recorded. It happened in the middle of um, this recent three-year La Nina event. Um, and the La Nina event, driven by the Southern Oscillation, is predicted to become more intense and frequent. So perhaps it's an, a hint of the kind of thing we might happen, uh, uh, how it might play out, what we might happen to see over the next few decades if we're unlucky. And my thinking is that, you know, modelling may well help us pre predict such, such events. And if it's if it's cleverly done, it might identify how multiple stresses interact. Look, I'd have to point out, of course, large tides are not a um, climate change um, causal factor. But um, I was just trying to demonstrate how things are into existing phenomenon can be can play alongside um, oncoming climate change events and cause trouble. Um, so the next slide, um, really the title, the, the title says it all, the project reiterated that the threats are real. I've put up a couple of, uh, a couple of slides there. Um, look, the, the one you're very familiar with and TC showed a good example of the, um, the shifting, the shifting line, uh, of marine heat wave encroachments. But the second one I've really included there for a bit of fun. Um, I took that photograph in Latvia about a month ago was on a forestry information board. They're big on forestry over there, about 60% of the countries in forest. And it shows atmospheric carbon dioxide levels over the millennium. But the interesting bit is the spike at the end. It's not a spike, is it? It's a point on a rising continuum. Um, and I, I put that in just to show that everyone's aware of it all around the world, even though we don't really do much about it. I mean, the, the Baltic states aren't famously green. Um, Greenpeace doesn't really have an office in Riga, for example. Um, and in Latvia, 85% of their um, their power generation is from um, coal-fired thermal stations. But still, they know what's coming. So I just wanted to make that point that um, the threats are real. Um, marine heat waves are becoming more frequent. They're more intense. They're lasting longer. And ocean is becoming more acidic. Look at that Latvian graph again. The more CO2 that's in the atmosphere, um, the more it will be absorbed by the ocean and the more the pH will drop. It's very simple, basic chemistry. Um, and there's no avoiding that. 
So our seas are going to become more acidic, and that's demonstrably happening now. I think there was quite a bit of research out of um, Otago that would demonstrate that. Um, you can you can see all that. Look, our things that are at a personal level, our power divers are um, taking spear guns to work in Fiordland now because they can shoot kingfish over summer. Well, well, I used to dive down there a lot, and I never ever saw kingfish. So things are changing. Modelling can help anticipate what's coming and it can help us with the level of threat that we'd like to have to face and then maybe we can we can prioritize where our efforts go yeah and the a third thing that came out of this project for me was that it reiterated again that there are research gaps i mean we've got sophisticated models i mean the current population model uses um that's used for um, the ministry and government stock assessments incorporates a number of inputs for example age at maturity growth rates catch levels catch rates and so on it can all this but the particular model we use can also incorporate spatial effects um and it can um, incorporate uh, management measures such as variable highs uh, uh, variable size limits so if we voluntarily increase the size of the catch that can be um that can be um uh, dealt with inside the model look not all but models, as all of you know, probably many better than I do, that models are only as good as the um, the data that you feed into them. Um, and just for example, I'll just put a couple of examples here. Um, not all sources of um, fishing are, me are accurately measured. And, and for a model to work, you really know have to know what amount of fish is coming out of your fishery in a year. Um, the example we have in New Zealand that's a bit of a bit of a noisy one is that um, we've got extremely accurate data on commercial and customary um, harvest levels, but recreational take, which can be quite significant, is poorly understood. The estimates for power two, for the, uh, for example, are a recreational take of about 80 tonne per annum um, compared to a commercial catch of about 122 tonne. But we don't actually know where that recreational take is taken, and we actually don't know whether we're even in the ballpark with that number. The error bars are just too big to, be, to make it useful. So we need that information. We don't have it. Um, there are more interesting things that the scientists might find interesting is that um, just questions that pop into my head is a short, sharp heat wave, uh, which we're seeing more of, more damaging than a milder and a longer one? Does the timing of that heat wave matter? Which part of the power life cycle does it do the most damage if you have a heat wave? Is it when they're spawning? Is it when, when the larvae are settling? Is it when they're trying to grow and um, seaweed gets burned off? We don't know, but useful information to have um, into the future. And we also don't know too much um, uh, uh, about the effects of um, climate change on food species, the kelps, such as uh, important kelps, like the very palatable high-protein Macrocystis periphera, which they scoff, um, they're very vulnerable to storms. They just get blasted to pieces in a bad storm, and they're very vulnerable to sea temperature regimes. But tying that to the power life cycle uh, is a gap. It hasn't been done properly. Um, and, of course, the long-term physiological effects of environmental stress. Well, we may see that already in the top parts of the North Island. I mean, um, AUT, that's the Auckland University of Technology, have been co-working with us on physiological baseline setting at the Chatham Islands. But um, there are ongoing funding issues, just like all research, um, and that will reduce the effectiveness of that um, research. Um, and I'd be very interested, you've probably got some uh, uh, participants here who might have some useful um, research that they'd like to be see done. I'd, I'd welcome any suggestion from anyone on that sort of thing. And finally, and really one of the big ones for me um, in, in my job is, um, quite frankly, in New Zealand, our legislative regime, it's just not responsive enough anymore. It's a good regime, but it's, it, ne it, it needs to be, um, it needs to be, it needs to be worked up. Um, power assess, uh, uh, all power quota management areas are assessed, but that happens infrequently, every four or five years or so. Uh, it's certainly not frequent enough for a vulnerable fishery like abalone, where, and especially in, in changing times. Um, marine heat waves are coming. You can get a bad marine heat wave coming through in a matter of, in a matter of months. We can't really do much about it for four or five years if we don't have a stock assessment. So um, we're, we're enthusiasts for management procedures, um, which the rock lobster industry have been running extremely successfully for a couple of decades. Um, and I would point out that MSC certification generally requires a management procedure or harvest control to be in place before you can get such certification. They're the best tools to respond rapidly to any changes in your fishery, yet we don't have 
we don't have support for them, uh, certainly not legislative support. Um, at the moment, we do a lot of stuff, but it's all voluntary. Um, we think that there should be regulatory support, um, in, 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 a, a regulatory support for a mechanism that allows industry to act collectively. It's a natural and desirable step, for, a next step for the quota management system. It allows a collective of fisheries to agree on a management measure and for the commercial part component of a fishery be bound by that agreement by way of a regulatory support. Um, variable size limits are important to us and any abalone scientist will tell you that um, having a single size limit for New Zealand from Cape Reinga to Rakiura, that's Stewart Island, um, doesn't work. It's too big a range of environments and it just doesn't work for the, it uh, doesn't work for the species. The only place that has a, a differing size limit is Taranaki. Um, everywhere else, uh, it's 125 millimeters in the Taranaki, it's 85. Um, too much is centralized. What can I say? I don't need to say much more about that. Too many decisions get made in Wellington. Really, we need a more regional approach to um, dealing with local fisheries like power. Um, and I'd point out that um, that that opening slide, that opening sequence was really it's a subpopulation on a single reef um, to the north of Tora. That population is pretty much self-sustaining. Um, so how does Wellington deal with small area effects like that? Well, they can't. Um, and I, I'm really in New Zealand. We don't deal with um, the displaced catch question. I mean, no one wants to face up to the consequences of closing areas to the health of the wider fishery that's caused by the displaced catch. That's a fact of the matter in New Zealand, and um, I think it needs to be faced and dealt with. Um, yeah. So look, the, it was a, it was a thought provoking and interesting project and exercise. And just to end on a cheerier note, um, just so that you. The opening uh, video footage wasn't a one-off from the wire wrapper. Um, check out this one just from some shallower water. The nice collections and of stones. Oh, there we go. For, and for participants, storm, what is shallow versus deep in your mind thinking? Uh, okay, the first one was taken about 100, 150 metres offshore and about uh, 7 metres, I think. And this one, as you can see, is quite shallow water. This will be um, 10 metres offshore in probably two steps. Thank you. That's it for me. I look forward to any questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Storm. Um, I'll now hand over to Dean. Yeah, Kia ora, Tato, and um, thank you for... Um... Uh, for being part of this um, uh, session today. So certainly the first question, I suppose, is why why, why would a bank or why are banks interested in this kapapa? And I think the um, to start with, uh, ultimately, uh, as you can hear, this is um, uh, an intriguing uh, project, uh, one that is, is, I think, quite in some ways very really leading edge in that uh, trying to understand climate change uh, and model it is is, is a new thing and, and, and quite challenging. Um, Equally, um, trying to understand, uh, you know, the, the you know, understand nature and, and, and how climate change in nature can be modelled is, is again uh, adding complexity to complexity. So, it was something that um, that uh, is becoming uh, very important, and I say that because uh, the world is changing and climate risk and biodiversity loss are the twin crises. And New Zealand has signed up to. Um, the uh, Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, and that framework uh, commits uh, countries to the 30 by 30 initiatives to protect 30% of land and oceans globally by 2030. So, so New Zealand's going to be part of that. I think it's important to realise that, uh, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit further, you know, there is a, a global mega trend happening where uh, the sustainability of businesses and the supply chain, uh, uh, the sustainability of the supply chain generally is, is increasingly in focus. Uh, for uh, businesses, then uh, there is a, a new world where uh, there, New Zealand was the first country to commit to um, mandatory financial disclosure uh, statements, which um, require a number of New Zealand businesses from next year to uh, publicly disclose um, climate-related risks of their business. And so that includes uh, listed uh, bond and equity issuers, banks, insurance companies, uh, and a number of our large investment managers. And so there's uh, naturally a, a need to really understand um, the impacts on your business and, and on, the, on the balance sheet from a bank's point of view. That means we need to understand uh, what's happening to the various businesses that we, that we lend to. 
Um, I, I sort of touched on the complexity around this challenge. Uh, it was, I suppose, look, being uh, perfectly honest, uh, I was the, the least knowledgeable of this group on on this uh, on this topic on, on understanding uh, the marine environment and power. And so, for me, uh, that was a, a great opportunity to learn. And so, I see appreciate the expertise that was there. I think uh, the point I, I made here as well is that really to, to attract investment, um, then there's going to be an increasing need to understand uh, climate risk to incorporate into strategy because uh, without that understanding, then um, there, there will be uh, assumptions made that uh, businesses uh, have inherent risks that could be over or understated. So uh, the unknown is not helpful to us. And this project tries to uh, put some uh, modeling around uh, scenarios that allow users to explore what uh, the future may look like and if the future plays out what the impact could be on uh, on asset values in this case uh, the power coda value uh, that quote there uh, on the first slide was just pointing out that inaction uh, comes with a significant cost so doing nothing is really not uh, the right option. Um, yeah, so if we move to the next slide, um, this is what I was talking about. So what are the big drivers we're seeing behind what I what I term to be a global mega trend? I've, I've touched on the uh, sustainability as a strategic driver, and um, I think that's really important to think about. It, it's, it has to be more than just a compliance exercise, even though compliance is becoming uh, a part of uh, this this trend. And when I'm talking about compliance, I've touched on uh, the mandatory disclosure statements, but as well as that, um, we are seeing, for example, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand coming out uh, this year and uh, consulting, on, putting out guidance on um, uh, uh, scenario testing uh, for their stakeholders being banks and insurance companies. And um, that's really trying to uh, allow an understanding of the resilience of business models in both the short and the long term, uh, in terms of in relation to the finance sector, and so really this model is is sort of reflecting that sort of approach. Uh, you know, trying to understand the resilience that is inherent in uh, in the in this, um, in this in this particular business. Um, I put there the access to capital, the cost of capital is is becoming um, intrinsically linked to the sustainability of 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 of, of the business, and, and what I mean by that is. New Zealand imports a lot of capital, we, and we export a lot of um, uh, products, uh, food food products, and so um, that by its nature means that uh, there's a there's a big focus in terms of um, how we uh, collectively as a nation are, are perceived in the global global world, and so what we're seeing is that uh, our access to markets, our traditional export markets through free trade agreements, as well as our access to capital as 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 a as a finance sector to be able to fund businesses is all intertwined with how we're perceived and the sustainability and the evidence we can show um, around that. So, so that, that's an important driver. Uh, tied into that is the conscious, conscious consumer. And by the, what I mean by that is an increasing focus from uh, a number of markets, often on premium markets, in terms of being discerning around uh, the quality and the integrity of the products they're buying. So, uh, so again, we need to sort of be conscious of that uh, and I think there's a, there's a rise in stakeholder expectations. Um, I'm talking about the broader stakeholders. Um, that, that social license is important to keep in mind, and um, and even attracting or taming staff. Uh, you know, people younger people have preferences to work for businesses that are not just um, uh, returning a, a a good financial return, but also uh, considering their broader their broader impacts in terms of uh, of the environment. Um, so if we move to the next slide, um, this this is an attempt to bring this together in, in, in a framework, and I think it's uh, one, one of the considerations there is around the fact that you know, if we can, um, uh, for, 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 a, for the blue economy, having strategic goals, policies, objectives, and analysis about the state of the marine environment, it helps underpin brand, it helps, uh, it helps with compliance, and improves that social license and and the the confidence of uh, of, of, sta of of shareholders and, and stakeholders, and you know potentially it could lower the cost of capital uh, as well. So, you know that sort of summarizes up in a framework some of the things that are uh, uh, sort of supporting in terms of the overall framework. Look, I'll move uh, to talk about the model, and 
I guess the thing I'd highlight is that we won't have time today to go through in detail and talk through the model. However, uh, acknowledging the work that Christine Smith has done in terms of not only building a model, but documenting a guide that's available. And so um, uh, while the this is a quite a complex thing trying to model, we have tried to uh, simplify it as best we can. Um, and when I say it's challenging, the reason why it is challenging is that ultimately uh, we're seeing, I suppose, some non-linear aspects to the way that climate change hits. And that is that you, you can get extreme weather events that are um, unpredictable, so they don't necessarily happen in a, in, a, in, a, in a linear manner in terms of their severity or frequency. Uh, and so that makes it hard to, 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 to model. Uh, the potential impacts are not easily mitigated or reversed. And I, I suppose the point I made there, that third bullet point, when I say that they, that they can impact multiple lines of business simultaneously, the slide at the start that showed the road being washed out, well, that's an example that if access to your uh, to your assets being your 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 boat uh, is is wiped out, then uh, you may not be able to catch anything. And so that one event uh, can actually uh, cause a quite a significant uh, revenue impact uh, for the business. And finally, and I, th I think this is an important one, is that, that our traditional models don't necessarily help us in terms of modeling climate related risks. And I say that because you know historical events aren't necessarily uh, giving us much uh, of an idea of what will come in the future. Uh, so, whereas I think in a lot of our um, financial modelling, we have built up uh, a strong understanding of, of cause and effect based on histor historical events and use those as being a predictor for the future uh, and putting some certain uh, 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 analysis around that, of course. But in this case, we're finding that that is not particularly helpful. And so we can't just take what we've used in other modelling exercises and apply it in this case. And so... I guess what I'm highlighting is that uh, this is, um, I think, the a, a new and evolving space and one that is particularly challenging. Uh, moving quickly to the next slide, uh, then look, um, so look, trying to sort of sum up what we've done here. Um, so the uh, this is a binary economic model. Effectively, it's a valuation model. It's not intended to be a predictive model. And so, so just highlighting that. So we're not predicting the future. It is a starting point that has an inherent limitations and, and assumptions that are there. Um, however, it does allow the the the, uh, the user to be able to uh, uh, to select their own assumptions and 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 see uh, how they um, translate in terms of out outputs. Um, the model has uh, um, uh, has up to. Um, uh, 31 different uh, fishing subzones, and you can select uh, the number that you wish to, to test across. Um, it is in an, in an Excel model, which I think most people will be familiar with, which allows you to go in and look, you can select uh, one of the scenarios that's pretty populated, and there's 16 of those, uh, and you can then uh, effectively plug and play and sort of see how those play out. Um, so, uh, what um, so what you can do then is you can you can make assumptions around that. We've 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 plugged in some of the stresses I put there around uh, growth mortality and recruitment, and ultimately I suppose that the, the way I'd sort of highlight this would be that total allowable commercial catch is is impacted by the scenarios that you choose. Uh, we've then uh, made us uh, use that as a way of uh, calculating value. So naturally the the rise or fall in terms of the available catch uh, plays out in terms of what can be harvested. That is also then uh, used to work out a, a value of what is caught. Uh, and then we have uh, applied, as Tony mentioned before, the weight of, weight of average cost of capital uh, is, is inbuilt in that with the ability to add a risk premium for climate related risks. And so putting all that together, that then puts a value on the catch for that particular scenario. And so you'll see we've, we've allowed a graph over a 20 year period for the scenarios that you build uh, and what happens to the value of the catch under each of those scenarios. So look, um, I don't know whether that's, uh, that's probably as clear as mud uh, or as clear as the water on a, on a murky day, but um, ultimately the guide w is there to, to take you through how the model works. And so we certainly encourage you to have a play. Um, 
what uh, I think uh, the final point, yeah, so it's look, I, we've got a summary there of what it looks like when you go in, you put in your scenarios, play your current scenario, ultimately at the bottom, uh, you've got the um, uh, quota management assessment summary, which is sort of the numbers that you can actually sort of see what, what's, what's the basis for, uh, for, for the calculations. And then the graphs are shown as well as part of that. Um, we hope that we, we believe it's a simple model that is transparent and relatively easy to use. Um, so look, I, I mentioned uh, already that uh, you know we've created 16 pre-populated scenarios. I think they're they're a great starting point to get an idea as to how uh, how they flow. Um, I suppose the, uh, the the thing that um, we think that this is useful in terms of um, working out uh, impacts and look, as we put there, uh, careful risk analysis and targeted mitigation strategies are something which may be benefited from, from this approach. I guess one of the learnings are, I'm going to hand back to Tony shortly to talk, talk about some of the learnings, but there's, there's clearly some gaps in terms of the interrelationships between the stresses that we don't know yet, and so that obviously impacts in terms of our ability to model those. Um, and uh, as as there is better data and better understanding of, about uh, some of these uh, these impacts uh, and, and, and 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 the timing impacts of the of the environmental changes, then that will help uh, others. I think to take this modelling further. And um, so we we do hope that this is this first step will be informative and useful for uh, for for others who wish to uh, investigate this type of type of work. Um, so look, uh, I'll pass back to Tony and we'll uh, sum up before going to Q&A. Brilliant. Uh, thanks, um, Dean and, and Storm for your minute. So learnings and where to from here. Um, uh, clearly climate change and nature are highly complex uh, uh, for us to deal with. Um, the integration of those, these factors into the financial monitoring is challenging but necessary. Uh, we need to refining the model to make sure that we can get better and, and more robust results from people's um, use of it and uh, applying of varying scenarios. Uh, it's climate ecological impact research is in its early stage and needs to be invested in uh, to research long, much longer time frames. in my view. Um, we're talking about tens of years, not six months. Um, we need a, and we need more flexible and responsive management frameworks. Uh, as we said, we're two from here. I think the, the key messaging we need to make undertake more of that climate impact research on commercially fish species. We use need to use that data to uh, improve risk modeling, and we hope that it will then begin the discussions on potential implications of different scenarios, particularly in respect of policy development. The flexibility and manage, more managed resp responses, and the, and the need for more flexibility and more localized uh, uh, decision making, as Storm rightfully pointed out, and of course uh, to assist in resilience planning. So, with that, I'll hand back to you, Saif. Great, thank you, Tony, Dean, and Storm for your kōrero. Uh, we now have some time for questions, so please do pop these through in the Q&A. Uh, to get the ball rolling, I'd like to ask you all how you see the model evolving into the future. I'll, I'll, I'll throw out a starter. Look, I, I think um, we are going to see, and we, we tend to find with, um, with these types of models, um, given this is quite new, that there will be evolution. There's quite a bit of work being done trying to understand how best to sort of capture some of the uh, aspects that are challenging. But ultimately, uh, I think as was pointed out uh, at the start, really the mo model is only as good as um, uh, the inputs. And I think one of the one of the things we uh, that, that I learned on the way through is that you know, you know while there's quite a bit of research on the impact of certain stresses, um, where the gaps are is in terms of what the correlation is between them all. And so um, when you start getting to the complexity of, of multiple stresses happening at the same time, then there's certainly some gaps that we that we, um, that we don't uh, know that well and therefore we can't model. So I think there's a combination of things. I think 
understanding techniques of, of climate change and, and modeling will improve. And hopefully we'll see uh, better uh, further research and better knowledge uh, of um, exactly how the relationships uh, work as well. And that will improve the, the modeling aspects as well. Do you want us? I, it's a pretty, pretty good answer, I thought, Dean. Um, really um, can't add much to it, but I, I think it's, um, it's, it's hopefully the model is in a form that um, quota owners and people on the, are, you know, that are subject to what the barriers that, that will happen can use it to begin, begin to look at what ifs, in my view. What if this was happened? What if, you know, this happened? What would that mean for this fishery? And I think, I think that's the key to it. This begins to explore the what ifs and how and what they might mean for every for a particular fishery. Actually, Tony, just on that point, I mean, if we had perfect information and you had this information across all fishery, fish species, then naturally that would highlight where the opportunities lie uh, from this because it's easy to sort of see these things as being negatives, and as, uh, but there are some opportunities that will come out of it. I guess what we don't know, we don't have enough information to really uh, be able to you know, have that foresight. So, um, yeah, look, there's... Yeah, these models are useful uh, because they do allow strategic thinking to go to come come forward, and I'd agree with that. Great, thank you, Bob. Uh, Storm, I can see you've been answering some of these questions in the chat, but maybe if you just want to speak a little bit about um, the seeding of pawa larvae in juveniles for a, as a tool for managing wild stock. Sure. Um, yeah. Um, hi, Paul. Um, uh, so that they they come under the heading of fisheries enhancement. That's stuff you do over and above um, normal fisheries management. It's um, uh, I don't know for any number of reasons. There might be a gap in recruitment in a particular bay. You might want to um, increase the rate of rebuild of, of an area um, or any number of reasons. But um, two of the two of the methods um, uh, of enhancement are by um, uh, um, re reseeding by way of using um, juvenile power and generally in the 10 millimeter through to 40 millimeter range around the world is um, reseeding and you might want to do larval reseeding which is um, uh, spawning power and um, getting them through to immediate pre-settlement stage um, probably say three or four days um, and then just um, putting them into um, suitable habitat and just letting nature take over both of them have their advantages and disadvantages um, the power industry has had a lot of experience with outplanting of um, juvenile seed power, um, and we've been doing work, and um, Paul Wolf, who's been asking questions, has been closely involved in some of that in the Kaikoura area post-earthquake, when we had some, when we had, um, we put up some money, and there was some um, Ministry of Fisheries funding that went towards that. Um, but as I said, the, both of them have advantages and disadvantages. The uh, disadvantage for... Um, juvenile seed is that it's a very expensive um, and probably at this stage given the cost structure in New Zealand not cost effective but it is effective if you put out larger seed in the 30 to 40 millimeter range for for level um, outplanting um, the jury's out I think Paul and the others in Kaikoura had some some hints of success they had they did have some success but once again it's it's very hit and miss and um well, the short answer is, and someone pointed it out, Jess, I think, is that, um, look, funding for any research in New Zealand is a problem, and I'm guessing that fisheries research is a long way down the list. Um, there's a lot more to do, and that is some of the um, research questions we'd like answered. Um, uh, shall I answer the question from Jess regarding... Um, the elephant in the room funding. Yeah, I'll just read it out just so we have that on record. Uh, so from Jess, regarding the physiological research ideas discussed, we collectively, collectively have the expertise and facilities across New Zealand to answer these questions. The elephant in the room is funding as mentioned. Research is expensive, so just a comment that we really need to be collaborating and working together more across our institutions to achieve the best science and make the best use of the collective skills and funding we have, rather than risk duplicating research. Uh, couldn't agree more, Jess. Uh, I, I also think that one of the things that um, 
uh, is lacking is is a wider social awareness of the impacts of climate change to some of these species, particularly these Taonga species uh, that both customary, recreational, and commercial hold dearly. And I think we've got to lift the lift the awareness levels up so that there is pressure brought to bear uh, in a greater sense of um, not necessarily um, fighting over what's there, but designing programs that can be uh, uh, run through multi-agencies, but that are funded sufficiently enough to give us the right answers. So I agree with that. All right, thank you. Uh, and a question here from Leslie Bolton Ritchie. Uh, has the model been used by anyone to date? Is it anticipated that in individual fishers will use the model or would it be used for larger geographic areas? That's a good question, Leslie. Um, so at the moment, we're in discussions with Moana New Zealand. So Moana is one of the biggest Oiderona holders in the fisheries to see if that, if we can run some of the uh, and they hold it in different QMAs which makes it makes it quite useful to have a look at this model in respect to those different QMAs we're hopeful that they'll come on board use it and can it use yes by individual fishers particularly once we get to find the finer scale management to better understand if it's individual fishers we should say divers but for, for divers to better understand where where the best areas may be uh, uh, to improve overall fishing efficiency. So I see it being used for them as well. Great, thank you, Tony. Um, we probably have time for one final question. Uh, what do you see as the biggest barriers to people being able to use this research in practice? Yeah, you wanna go, Kathy? I think it, <clears throat> kia ora koutou, um, Catherine Short from Goingoa in Taramoana might be one for me. So he, um, I think um, really it's the interdisciplinary and interdisciplinary nature of it uh, in that um, it hasn't perfectly answered the question on any front, but it's definitely advanced the coming together of, of the perspectives. And um, we hope it uh, gets picked up and taken forward by um, researchers in every field. Um, valuation field, modeling fields, science research fields, um, industry um, business perspectives um, uh, to to and then you know ideally at some point people will regroup and, and actually re, re, redevelop it uh, or develop a new version that, that builds upon it. Um, but should, you know act, actually anchoring these significant environmental challenges in in the financial realities um, as was originally envisaged, um, will also hopefully drive investment in, in some of the um, mitigation and, and adaptation resilience strategies. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Catherine. All right. Now we're just about at 2.30, so that is going to conclude our webinar for today. Uh, a big thank you to our presenters for sharing their research highlights and for answering those questions, and thank you to the audience for asking the questions. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you all with us today. We'll have an email in your inbox soon uh, with links to this research and a link to the recording as well. Uh, but in the meantime, please do visit the Sustainable Seas website if you'd like to, to read a bit more about this research or the wider work of the challenge. Thank you all for coming along. Ka kite. Okay, thank you.